Welcome to this lecture on clustering. As you've already seen, we learned a lot about classification and regression as supervised machine learning tasks. And the distinguishing feature here was that we had features, we had an X, and we had classes. And our goal was prediction. Today, we're going to learn about an unsupervised learning technique. And here we only have features. And the goal is exploration. So the idea is to find similarities in the data. There are a variety of different clustering approaches. There are partition algorithms, which are flat, and hierarchical algorithms, which take into account the hierarchy, as the name tells. This lecture will mostly focus on partition algorithms, especially k-means. But just to give you an overview, for the partition algorithms, we recognize k-means. We know that there's algorithms that are based on the mixture of Gaussians. There's also spectral clustering. And what they have in common is that they find similarities in the data. This is tried to be illustrated. So we try to illustrate this here with the Simpsons. So we have one cluster, for instance, and that's the Simpson family, right? That's one family. They have family resemblance. They are related to each other. And then there could be another cluster here. And that's the group of people that are employed by the school in Springfield. With the hierarchical algorithms, we distinguish between bottom-up approaches, so-called agglomerative approaches, and top-down approaches, divisive approaches. And what you can see here is you try to find a hierarchy here. You have the mother and daughter, Lisa and March, and you also have Patty and Selma as the sisters, and then they are again um, related to each other because Patty and Selma and March are sisters. Um, so here you try to have groups, you try to build, in both cases you try to find groups, but for the hierarchies it's about the structure, whereas the partitions are more flat. Why would you need clustering approaches? One popular application is the so-called image segmentation, and the idea here is to break up an image into meaningful or perceptually similar regions. Another famous application of clustering algorithms is to cluster the gene expression data. And there's a famous paper by Eisen et al., which they analyze and display a large transcriptome, which is a microarray, um, which is an RNA sequence. And they used clustering to interpret the data by just finding similarities in the RNA sequences. Another example is vector quantization. So the idea here is to find ways of minimizing the data to compress images and to just only save the parts that really need to be saved, right? This is a compression problem that you find in a variety of image compression algorithms like JPEG and like GIF. And quite early on, they use these clustering algorithms to find large areas that can be subsampled. That means that they can be saved with a stronger compression rate than other samples because it's just a large area and not a phase with high frequency. So the basic idea of clustering is to partition the data set into groups. And the idea is that points in one cluster are supposed to be similar to each other. I'm now going to give you a step-by-step -step overview on how such an algorithm works. You have data, but you have no labels, as we explained already. And it's really useful when you don't know what you're looking for. So let's pretend this is our data set, and that could again be the handwritten digits that we already considered. It could also be the breast cancer data, but here we don't know which is which. We just have these data points. And quite intuitively, you would agree with me that this, of course, is the perfect clustering. I mean, that's also the idea that I had when I made this example. But there's also a variety of different ways of clustering these. There could be a clustering like this. So there's a group on top and one on the bottom. There could be a group like this. And 
And the idea is to find ways of computing such clusters without external knowledge. And that's exactly what the so-called k-means algorithm is doing. Here again, we have three examples. And the idea is quite simple. We want to have a number of groups, and that's the k in the k-means. So here we say we have an hypothesis. We estimate, we think that there are three groups in the data. And what k-means does is, is that it defines a variety of centroids. So if we have k equal to 3, then we set three central points, and we decide these center points randomly. We just put them somewhere, and then we iteratively improve our center points so that they are central to a large number of data points. And that's what you see here. We start randomly, and then we change and move the center points so that a large number of points is part of each of the clusters and that the clusters are well balanced. And I'm going to show you how that's computed in a second. Here's another example that's a bit more realistic, to be honest. These are the handwritten digits, I think. Um, and what you can see here is that, unlike the, say, idealized example that I showed you before, the reality is that the boundaries are not so nicely defined, right? So the, the clustering is subjective and there will be many edge cases that don't work so well. But uh, yeah, so this is what it looks like in reality. The other thing is just to give you an impression on how three clusters would look like. So let's recap what I told you. So we have an hypothesis in this particular setting and that's that we suspect that there are k different groups in our data. And our approach is to randomly pick k points in our space then measure the similarity somehow, and then optimize it using expectation maximization. And that's an important machine learning algorithm, and it's a way of optimizing the number of clusters for k-means. For similarity, we will consider the Euclidean distance here. You should all know that, right? It's just the distance in a coordinate system. And uh, it's just how far apart the different points are from each other. There are a variety of other similarity metrics. We will learn about uh, kullback leibler divergence, for instance. But here, for this simple example, we will stick with the Euclidean distance. And we have these two steps when we're training a k-means model. We have an expectation step and a maximization step. So in the expectation step, we compute how likely the different, we, we compute how likely the current parameters are. And in a way, that's answering the question of how good we are. In the maximizing, the maximization step, the goal is to update the parameters in order to maximize or to minimize some measure. That's what we're looking at in this equation. So here I made some helpful remarks. Um, the goal is that for all of the samples and for all the clusters, we compare each sample and its location, its proximity, the distance to the current cluster center. And then this is just a binary value and it's set to 1 if xn is in the cluster, if the value that we're considering is in the cluster, and 0 if it's not. That's the expectation step. So here we try to find an R and K so that the data points are assigned to the nearest cluster. In the maximization step, we find means that minimize J uh, so that we have a local optimum. So here we look at each of the samples. And again, this is just a derivative of our function J, of our expectation, of our error measure in respect to um, k, that's the um, different uh, data points that we're considering. So we have our error measure here. That's our expectation. And we can now do the derivative, just like we did in the regression example with the linear regression. So we can take our error measure, our performance metric, and we take a derivative in respect to the current cluster centers that we have. 
And here again, for all of the samples, we compare um, each sample to the current cluster center, and we have this factor that tells us whether uh, the number, the, the point is in the cluster or not. And we can take a derivative here. So the idea is that we have the derivative and then we can use this information to update our current cluster centers. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. We initialize the points and then we update them step by step, again using partial derivatives in respect to an error measure. That's a very fundamental idea of machine learning and it's quite nicely visualized here, I think. There are a variety of other clustering approaches that are worth considering. You can see the k-means on the very left and what we see here is four different data sets, right, with different shapes. Uh, and we can see how the different machine learning clustering algorithms perform on subdividing this data. And you can see that some are better than others for certain applications. This is from the documentation of scikit-learn, so you can just find it online and just read it online to get a feeling of what's the better approach for your problem. You have to be careful because such algorithms are prone to fall into local optima, and that's why it's really important to look at your data and to visualize your data. For instance, if we look at the one here on the left, we see that here we have two center points very close to each other um, in data that looks quite similar. So here it would probably be better to have one more cluster, to just have one cluster. So we have too many clusters here. Whereas on the example on the right, we have two clusters, we have visually at least two clusters. So it would be much better to probably have two cluster centers here. And in a way, that's how you determine the K. Empirically, that means through trying out different metrics and to see how they perform. Coming back to the clustering algorithms, so I showed you a partition algorithm here in detail, the k-means algorithm. There are also hierarchical algorithms uh, like agglomerative clustering. And here the idea is quite simply to work bottom up, right? So you First, try to merge very similar instances and then incrementally build larger clusters out of smaller clusters. So you maintain a set of clusters and initially each instance is its own cluster and then you just repeat it, right? You pick the two closest clusters, again, based on a similarity metric, like for instance, the Euclidean distance, and then you merge them into a new cluster and you stop when there's only one cluster left. The question is, of course, how do we define the closeness of different clusters to each other if they have multiple elements? And here are sketched out different ways. You could take the average, that's what's shown on the bottom. It's the average of all the points in cluster A compared to cluster B. But you can also use the closest point and the closest pair, right? The two points that are the closest to each other or the pair that is the furthest apart. And this will greatly change and influence how your clustering results will look like. So that's again an important hyperparameter, an important modeling decision that you make while training the model. Here I try to visualize these, right? The average farthest and nearest based on the mouse tumor data from Hasty et al. And you can see that it really has a strong influence on the result which also shows that these algorithms are not magic, right? They don't know anything in a way. They just follow a set of rules and then they come up with some order based on the criteria that you defined. 